Welcome to Opal STV. I'm in Singapore together with Scott Cal. We are here at the Seoul Asia Conference. Scott was the Chief Investment Officer of KIC, the Korean Sovereign Wealth Fund. Now, Scott, I'm curious, how do you become a Chief Investment Officer of a Sovereign Wealth Fund? It's very difficult. Actually, uh, it was a great honor for me to be asked by the, uh, the government of Korea to to go over and become the CIO and Deputy CEO of the uh, Korean Sovereign Wealth Fund. It's a bit unusual. There are no other Sovereign Wealth Funds that I'm aware of that have had a foreigner who was uh, in such a position. So it was a great honor. In my case, actually, I have a long history in Korea. I had worked for the Korean government in the past, so it was my second time working for the Korean government. I speak the language. I had lived there for a long time back in the, uh, in the 1980s. And so, you know, I have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, knowledge of how things work in the government and, uh, and uh, a pretty good understanding of the culture. And so it was a great fit. What is your own investment career? During the, uh, I, I lived in Asia for about 10 years in the 1980s. At that time, I worked for the Korean government. I also worked uh, for a few different investment banks. Uh, in the 90s, I was back in the U.S. I worked uh, for uh, Solomon Smith Barney, Citigroup, uh, for about 10 years. And then in the 2000s, I was in the alternative investment space. I worked for a while for Tudor. I had my own firm. I worked a bit with uh, a firm called uh, Baliazny. So it's a, you know, I have about a 25 year career in finance, in traditional asset management, in research, and also in alternatives. Tell us more about the investment process of strong wealth funds. When you work with external managers, for instance, hedge funds, right? How do you pick those managers? What's the process? The process is different for traditional asset management and for uh, alternative asset managers. So let's talk about alternatives. Alternatives, um, you have to have a very disciplined care. I mean, you have to have a disciplined process for everything you do. But uh, for alternatives, you have to be especially careful because everything is contract based. You're not in the public markets. You're investing as an LP. So you're going to have a, an LP GP relationship. So you have to, you know, you, you have to set up a process that's looking at things like track record. You have to look at, um, you know, staffing. You have to look at management. You have to look at not only past performance, but also strategy. You know, you have to you have to go look at systems. You have to look at risk management. You have to look at everything soup to nuts and make sure you, you vet the process completely. It usually takes uh, three to six months to select a manager, so it's a long process. You have to make sure that you get to see them on the ground and you have to do a thorough evaluation. I don't think there's any rocket science to it. Uh, my own belief is if you're going to invest in, well, let's take hedge funds, for example, you might as well, if you're going to start a program, you might as well start sort of top from the top down rather than bottom up. And that is, I believe, in working first with large, well-known, well-established firms. I don't mind if they have a lot of assets under management. Um, we've found that, you know, or I have found that asset managers, even with a lot of assets under management, can still continue to perform very well. I think there's some people believe that, you know, smaller, more nimble managers can get you better returns. But I think that uh, in the alternative space, it's not just about returns. Returns are a requirement. That's what gets you in the game. But besides that, a lot of what uh, you need to see is uh, has to do with the quality of the platform, the people, the infrastructure. You need a, a deep team to be able to be comfortable to invest with them. I think it's no longer about you know uh, a couple of guys who you know you, you, you give some money to them and then they make some money for you and, you, and they give it back to you. So it, it, you know those days are, are not around anymore. Um, Really, nowadays, what you need is a, is a partnership. Uh, so you want to invest with firms that are not only going to make returns for you, but are also going to be able to, uh, to provide you with information, provide you with software, who are going to be able to, uh, to help you to understand what's going on in the markets, 
who are going to help you to be a better investor. So it's really partnership. When do you redeem? When do you disinvest from a hedge fund manager? Or when would you redeem? One thing that's important is when you, uh, when you invest in hedge funds or any alternatives, you have to be thinking as a long-term investor. So you don't want to take your, um, your short-term money. You know, any, to the extent that you, know, you have obligations you need to meet uh, and you need to, uh, to keep money secure and safe so you can meet those obligations, that money should not be invested in hedge funds or alternatives. So, as I like to say, you don't put your lunch money or your rent money into hedge funds or any alternatives. Uh, that money needs to be safe, needs to be liquid, it's got to be active and, and available for you when you need it. So when you're, when you're investing in hedge funds, really that's the part of your capital that you're willing to commit for a longer term time horizon. One of the nice things about the, one of the advantages that sovereign wealth funds have is that they have the ability with a large part of their capital to be long-term investors. They are intergenerational funds, so that means that they're holding assets for 25 or 30 years. That's a very powerful tool as an investor. So when you invest with hedge funds, the first thing I would say to you is, you know, you got to expect to be there for a while, and uh, you can't just sort of run at the first sign of trouble. It's not, you're not like in the public markets. You can't just sort of pull your money out. So you should be investing, and it takes time. But what I would say is after a, you know, a reasonable cycle of investing, if, if your investment, your manager, is just not able to, to make returns when you expect him to do so, uh, then you have to think about redeeming. Um, but this is not a, this is a, you know, again, this is a partnership you're building here. This is not simply a rental. And that's the way you have to go about, uh, about investing. You know, you, you, you put your money in, into work and you, you should expect your manager will be able to perform particularly well in under certain conditions. If you look at his record carefully, this is a manager who does well in, in down markets or does well in up markets or does sort of consistently you know, through all environments, whatever the expectation is, you want to make sure your manager is meeting that expectation. So if this is a manager who does well in down markets, don't expect him to outperform in an up market. If he does well in up markets, don't expect him to outperform in a down market. Um, but if he's not doing what you expect him to do, what he was supposed to be doing, you know, that's when you have to uh, initiate some kind of discussions about uh, withdrawing. I think the other thing that's really important is when it comes to, to investing in hedge funds, it's uh, not being afraid. You go through a long due diligence process and uh, sometimes people say, gee, I've invested so much time and so much energy in doing this due diligence that I'm going to invest. And you can't be afraid after doing all your work, if something's not right, you can't be afraid to just say, no, I'm not going to invest. Now maybe you, you, know, you might feel like, oh, I've wasted this time and this, this you know, this manpower I've invested in this process, but you can't be afraid to do that. That's, that just goes along with it. And, right. and uh, in and, hedge funds... And, and, and how often does this happen? In hedge funds, it's, it's just as critical to figure out when not to invest as it is, you know, when to invest. So here's a couple of red flags I look for. You know, one of the things is that you, you, you know, you, it, it's not your job when you're investing in hedge funds. You know, it, it's a very costly, it's a very expensive asset class to, uh, to access. And it's not your responsibility to make those guys rich. It's your responsibility to try to get a return on your investment for your constituents or your family or whoever it is. Um, so as a fiduciary, uh, you have a responsibility to try to make sure you're getting the best terms that you can. Um, but after that, you know, you have to be willing to pay the freight, goes along with the industry, you know, the best terms you can get, but it's still going to be expensive. But some of the red flags I look for are uh, things like infrastructure. If I'm going to be paying a firm, if a firm has a lot of assets under management, I expect them to be reinvesting in their business. 
you don't want to see a firm, let's say that's you know it's got twenty billion dollars under management. It's charging two and twenty, and they have a staff of a hundred people. So twenty billion under management, charging two percent management fee. They're making four hundred million dollars in fees, and they got a hundred people. What are they doing with that money? The answer is a lot of it's just going into their pockets. So you want to make sure that you're investing in a firm that's reinvesting its capital in the business, and then you can support them. So if a firm wants to be like a Fortune 500 company, a hedge fund, then it's got to act like it. And that is, if it wants to have a $20 billion fund, then it should have a $20 billion infrastructure. They should have be reinvesting in uh, in analysts in managers, in back office, in systems. They should have a large client service department. They should have a large risk management department. You want to see them reinvesting in their business and then you can support them. So one thing is I, uh, that I look for is, is infrastructure. This is what I was talking about before about platform. You want to have a firm that has a very good infrastructure and that will also help to control risk. Uh, another red flag is a, a firm that Maybe, for example, um, having a strategy that is a long tail strategy. You know, there's many different ways. Hedge funds is uh, we talk about them as an overall asset class, but there's actually lots of different kinds of hedge funds, and they really fit in many different categories. Debt, there's long short equity, there's multi strat, there's macro. So um, you want to be aware of, of a firm that has a, has a strategy which requires a long time period, 24, 36 months or whatever it is, to make money, and yet has short-term liquidity and uh, fee arrangements uh, in their structure. Because then you can get a mismatch. You can be investing and maybe their strategy it takes you know let's say distressed debt for example it can take 24 months for one of those investments to work out and if they're offering you know annual or semi-annual liquidity you can find that you know the firm may come under pressure if there's a downturn from people withdrawing their capital before the investments have a chance to reach fruition so you want to make sure that liquidity and fee uh, firms pulling out their fees with the terms they offer match the strategy that they're investing in. Frankly, there's some structural issues in, in, the, in the hedge fund community. It's difficult to be investing in uh, a structure where managers are taking performance fees on unrealized gains because they'll take a performance fee at the end of the year even though the returns are unrealized and then what happens next year if the fund goes down many you know in that case many firms say well we'll have a high water mark so you know that means we won't get paid until the fund comes back but that's really sort of misleading because they've already, the reason why they're not going to get paid is because they've already been paid. And what happens if the fund never comes back? So it's, it's asymmetric. I think that if a, you know, if a firm, if a, if a hedge fund strategy is a trading oriented strategy, which produces a lot of realized gains in a, in a short time period, then taking performance fees on a short time period is not that problematic. But if it's a longer term strategy, and then you're taking your fees on unrealized gains, this is a little bit of a problem. So in that case, maybe you want to have try to have a structure which is longer term, a longer term lockup, and you're taking your fees over a longer term time horizon, and then everything matches up well. So that's also, a, I think, a structural issue. In the world of family offices, you always have the phenomenon that they club together and that they co-invest, that they do deals together, or that they sometimes also seed certain managers together. Is there a similar development in sovereign wealth funds? Do you also co-invest and how does that work? In the sovereign world, 
there's a growing trend toward there's there's two I think trends that are becoming uh, more and more important. One of them is a growing trend towards disintermediation, and the other one is a growing trend towards cooperation with each other. So let me talk about those. And first of all, both of those trends I think don't exist that much with hedge funds. They tend to exist with other alternative investments. Hedge funds tend to be more independent. You have your own process. You're investing. There's not much synergy uh, you get from working together. Now, there's not that many sovereign wealth funds in the world or sovereign institutions. So it's a smaller universe. We tend to be pretty collegial. The funds, uh, you know, talk and share ideas, and so I think that that that's very uh, promising. But the two trends I was talking about, disintermediation and cooperation among each other, that's happening more in other areas, for example, private equity or direct investing. So one thing people don't realize is, you know, there's maybe sovereign wealth funds, there's maybe 40, 45 in the world today. It's growing, the number, but 70% of the world's sovereign wealth funds were formed within the last 10 years. So it's a fairly new phenomenon. You have a few that have been around for a very long time, but many that were just formed really in the last decade. So there's kind of a, a maturation process going on. They, these, these firms are growing. They're becoming more powerful, more influential in the financial world, but they're also themselves growing and maturing in their own capabilities and in, in the roles they want to play in the financial marketplace. So one thing is, as they grow up and as they become more capable, I think you're seeing more and more sovereign funds moving to invest or to do things independently, and that's disintermediation. So uh, in the old days, you want to do something, you just give it to somebody, you pay them a lot of money, and they'll go do it for you. One of the things about alternative investments, just in general, private equity, hedge funds, real estate, infrastructure, all of these asset classes that are outside of the public markets is the overall re premium you can capture from illiquid investing is high, but the cost structure is also very, very high. It's expensive to access. So as these institutions become more sophisticated, and as they're seeking to lower the cost basis on illiquid asset classes. One of the ways to do that is to do more and more yourself. Uh, let's, let, let's take a simple example. Private equity. You invest in a fund, you put $100 million in a private equity fund, but then you're also saying, okay, and I'll pay full fees on that, but then I also want co-investment opportunities. And that means I want to be able to invest if there's a large investment that the fund is, that this fund is doing, um, well, I want the opportunity, if there's capacity available, to invest in that same deal side by side and not pay any fees there. So I'm paying for the freight here and over here I'm not. Well, that lowers my cost basis by 50% overall. So that's one obvious way. And then if you're going to do co-investing, well then, you may begin to start doing direct investments on your own. And when you do that, you eliminate the fee structure altogether well, it helps to, again, lower your overall costs in alternative investment. According to the, the literature I've, uh, that I've studied, uh, you can get a 750 basis point premium in the, uh, the illiquid asset classes. And that's a lot of money. That's a lot of, that's a lot of premium. And you think about it, in the public markets, there's an embedded cost that you have that you're, you are paying in exchange for liquidity. So if, if I said to you, Matthias, I said, okay, look, I want you to manage my money, but I want to have access to it at all times. So I'll give you this money, but I'm going to call you up any day and say, I want it back. You would say to me, okay, I'll, I'll manage that money for you, Scott, but your return's going to be much lower, right? Because I'm going to have to keep it liquid. So that's an extreme case, but in a sense, that is the cost structure that you get in the public markets. You're paying for the ability to have liquidity. 
it's embedded there in, uh, in, in, in the structure of the exchanges, the auditing, everything else, all your costs. And that's a, that's, a, that's a good arrangement because in the public markets, you want to have your liquidity. But what happens if you're an institution that doesn't need liquidity? Let's suppose you, you, know, you have a, a large balance sheet and you're investing for future generations and you're going to hold your assets for 20 or 30 years. You don't need the liquidity. Why would you want to pay that embedded cost in the public markets? So instead, you want to go to the private markets uh, to the extent that you can because you, with, if you take out that cost and you also look at the, uh, the premiums you can access, you can get such a higher return there in return for giving up that liquidity. If you don't need the liquidity, why not? The problem is the cost basis in that asset class is high. You have to pay um, roughly 200 basis points in management fees, around uh, 100 to 200 basis points in performance fees. And then there's a cost of por portfolio construction, dispersion costs, maybe 100 basis points or so, maybe 150. So by the time you're done with all your costs, you're only capturing a premium of maybe 100 to 150 basis points. So now you have to ask the question, is that enough of a premium to compensate me for the risk I'm taking for locking up my capital? And that's a difficult choice. So what, you, what do you want to do? What you want to do is, okay, I want to make sure I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm investing in these asset classes. I want to work with the best guys in the world because this is a complicated area, but I also want to reduce my costs. So how do I reduce that cost so I can capture more premium? I try to do more things directly. And if you have that capability, it's a, it's a very important way to go. And, and I think the sovereign funds are growing that capability. So they're disintermediating, they're doing more things directly. It means there's still room for them to work with good partners. But increasingly, they're going to want to work, invest with those partners and also invest side by side with them. The other thing that you're seeing sovereign funds doing is they go directly they can draw a lot of comfort from working together with other sovereign institutions. Uh, so I think increasingly you're seeing the sovereign funds working together to invest directly into companies. If they do that, they can lower their costs, they can transfer technology, they can align their interests better. You know, for example, when you invest with a manager, the manager may be motivated to exit an investment after seven years in order to generate some returns and fees but if you're a, a you know a, a long-term investor and you want to hold those maybe you don't want to exit the investment maybe you're just as happy to keep it going so you know you can uh, you can eliminate a lot of that drag on an investment so those two trends I think are important you have to keep an eye on them and I think that if the uh, the street doesn't pay attention to that, they're going to get left behind. And sometimes there is a discussion about sovereign wealth funds also fulfilling a political objective. Do you see that the case or is the objectives of sovereign wealth funds merely return driven and investment centric? There's often a misunderstanding here. Sovereign funds are not politically run. And you have to be careful about distinguishing a sovereign wealth fund from a state-owned enterprise, from, you know, all these different, you know, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of different institutions here and somehow they all get lumped together. Sovereign wealth funds are government-owned asset management companies that have a requirement to invest on commercial basis only to make returns for you know the people of their country or you know their constituents whatever whatever their mandate is so they are commercially run enterprises 100% government owned 100% commercially run so there's no sovereign wealth fund that i know of where the government's telling them what to buy and what to sell they can't do that they're not capable in my experience, that just doesn't happen. 
that may be different with state-owned enterprises uh, where you have a state-owned oil company or a state-owned electric generating company uh, which you know basically the government owns that company and it's in a business line and there may be an interest in going out and acquiring um, offtake or raw materials or you know expanding a network sovereign wealth funds are you know they're not commercial businesses they're investment companies they have to make a financial return and if they don't make a good return trust me uh, they get in, into trouble because they're all held accountable by the people of their country. The good news about sovereign wealth funds is that they tend to have a very small, if, you know, and sometimes, you know, zero, uh, liabilities. The fewer liabilities you have, the fewer obligations you have to pay out, the more long-term you can be. So sovereign wealth funds tend to, to be very long-term investors, and that's a very powerful tool. If you have a long-term time horizon, you can be counter-cyclical, which means you can lean into risk at the right times. When things go down and everybody's running away, you actually can be a buy, accumulate assets. And why not if you're going to hold them for 20 or 30 years? And when things are going up, you can let them go. That's the proper way to succeed as an investor. So the good news is sovereign wealth funds commercial and commercially motivated and long term a long term horizon the difficulty is that they are stewards of public capital and when you're a steward of public capital you're in the public eye and sometimes it can be very difficult to implement a long term investment strategy under leadership that's on a short term political cycle so you have even though you've got the ability to be a long-term investor, very often there are a lot of short-term pressures on you. So those kinds of political pressures can make life difficult. Sometimes funds can feel pressure to sell assets, you know, when the markets go down, to act pro-cyclically instead of counter-cyclically. So that, that's difficult, and that's not just for sovereign wealth funds, that's for any public fund there are always those pro-cyclical short-term pressures. The key to success is how you can continue to manage a long-term disciplined investment program despite those pressures. The more you can do that, the better off you're going to be. And I think that, quite frankly, I think that's true for any kind of institution and it, I think it's true for for individuals as well. To the extent that you've got some long-term money available, long-term savings, you know, having a long-term investment plan is going to serve you much better than trying to trade in and out on a short-term basis. You're going to get whipped around. So Scott, you had a successful term at the KIC. Why did you leave and what are you doing now? In Korea, the system is that uh, senior, I was a senior government official and senior government officials tend to serve one term in office and and one term at the Cassie is three years in some institutions it's as short as two years so I served a, a full term it was a great experience it's a very good organization uh, you know uh, and they're doing uh, terrific work uh, and it was great to be there but the term is done and so at this point I continue to do work for the the World Economic Forum I'm the vice chair of the Global Agenda Council for Long-Term Investment. And so we do a lot of policy work and uh, other work uh, regarding um, long-term uh, uh, investment solutions. I am a director of the Private Capital Research Institute, which is a uh, Harvard-based initiative on uh, doing uh, research and gathering data on uh, mostly on private equity. I'm. Um, doing some advisory work for some uh, some companies and uh, I also recently set up my own advisory company called KLTI Advisors which focuses on uh, long-term investment management and advisory solutions.